Okay, this is the third lecture in the series on the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this one, we're going to look at some mathematical predictions of how the pandemic uh, is likely to uh, progress in the future based on what how it uh, progressed in the past. Now, it's a really good idea to have a good read on this article here. So click on the link on the original PowerPoint slides. A really good summary of what happened in Wuhan in uh, February, March and April. Uh, the predictions in there were pretty much correct. And then much of the data that I've been accessing is using this site called Worldometers. And this will give you case numbers for every country in the world and it's updated on a daily basis. So in this session, we're going to look at data. So in this session, we're going to look at data that has been published. Um, and we're going to critically analyze this data. So that means really putting it into context and not just uh, believing the raw figures as being the true representative of what's really going on. So we're going to analyze this data like a scientist would, not how the general public would necessarily look at this data. And the key point of this session is to show what case numbers were probably like in March 2020, just before lockdown and the effects of lockdown, because that doesn't reflect what is seen in the official figures. So this table just shows how pandemics emerge. And if you've got uh, an infectious agent with an R0 of three, as we saw last week, and if one, on average, one infected person passes that infection on to three other people in five days, then you can make some crude estimates as to how many people are likely to be infected five, 10, 15, 20, up to day 35 later. And they are fairly crude estimates because pandemics don't quite work this uh, nicely, but what you can see is all you're doing is multiplying by one, one times three after five days, multiply by three again, and on day 10 there are nine new cases, and just repeat the process. And what you can see is early on, a pandemic could actually go relatively unhidden, and then suddenly it rears up with thousands and thousands of people affected, and that number can increase very, very quickly uh, in a very short period of time, which is effectively what happened back in February and March. So what I've done is I've taken that data from the previous slide, and plotted it, assuming a doubling time of every four days or every three days. And what you can see is that these two graphs follow exactly the same shape, okay? Because we've got a linear axis here. However, the difference between these two graphs is the scale. Here, we've got up to about 2,000 cases by day 35. Here, we've got up to 16,000 cases by day 35. So the shape of the graph is identical. They look identical. It's only when you look at the scale you see the difference. And this is where we use log graphs or log, uh, use log to base 10 axis on the graphs. And what if this effectively does is gives equal spacing from 1 to 10, from 10 to 100, and from 100 to 1,000. Because from 1 to 10 is a 10-fold increase, and from 10 to 100 is a 10-fold increase. And these two sets of data have been plotted on a log graph, and they both give a perfect straight line because both graphs are showing a doubling time of this one is four days, so that increases more slowly. This one is doubling time of three days, so this one increases more quickly. The rate of increase is exactly the same for each of these two data sets. They appear to have the same shape, but the axis is different, and this graph here shows that they are both graphs are increasing at a constant rate. And these graphs are really important because the slope of this graph tells us the rate of uh, the increase within uh, of our pandemic. So if this is a steep, gra uh, a steep straight line, then we know that the pandemic is increasing very quickly. If it's shallower, it's increasing less quickly. And that's more obvious to see than on these graphs here. Okay, so this is uh, UK death data um, from the start of the pandemic through to August plotted either on a linear graph, as you can see there, and a log graph, as you can see there. And these are taken straight from the Worldometers site. And you can see that the two, the two graphs are showing the same data, but they look completely different. Now on the linear graph, because there was a huge increase in deaths throughout August and May, this scale is sort of very large, it goes up to 40,000. And it looks like down here, it looks like very, very little was happening. And basically you can't see the change that's going on there because of the scale of the graph. 10,000 is there, so 1,000 is about there. So 1,000 deaths is barely visible on this graph. If we look at the log graph, we're plotting it in a different way so that each 
tenfold change is given equal weighting. And what we can see is that um, there is a nice straight, well, not particularly nice, but there is a, a straight line increase in cases all the way through March and April. So in this period here where the graph is curving up, on the linear graph, here it's showing a straight line. And this is allowing us to see the doubling rate of the pandemic in terms of deaths. So linear graphs are really easy to interpret if you've got numbers that are uh, in a relatively small range. If you've got numbers over several orders of magnitude, and this is one order of magnitude from 1 to 10, and from 10 to 100 another order of magnitude, if data spans several orders of magnitude, or even just a couple of orders of magnitude, often the log graph is much easier to see how the data is changing than a linear graph. Now one of the most important things to understand in a pandemic uh, is what is the doubling time of cases. So how long does it take for cases to double? Typically, how many days is that? And for the pandemic early on in March, we were looking at around three days. And this is a relatively crude calculation that I did. Now I was, I was following cases all the way through uh, March and even before March, trying to calculate the doubling time. And I was drawing my own graphs and trying to figure all of this out. And I came to the conclusion fairly on early on in March, well before lockdown was announced or even talked about, that the doubling time was likely to be about three days, maybe a little bit shorter than three days. And this is how I worked it out. So on the 6th of March, there were a total of 144 recorded cases. On the day after, there was an extra 55. On the day after that, an extra 68, and so on. So we can get a total cumulative recorded cases series going like this. And once you've got about seven days of data, you've got enough data to start doing a crude calculation. So what I did with this data is I looked at different possibilities, looked at how um, these case numbers could be achieved by multiplying the case numbers on the 6th of March by a number and then repeat that process. So 144, I multiply it by 1.25 to give 180, which is my prediction there, not far off. Then multiplied 180 by 1.25 to get 225, not far off, and repeated the process. And by day six, we're still not very far off. Day seven, it was starting to drift out a little bit. But this has told me that the doubling time was a little bit shorter than every three days. Now, if the math is troubling you, don't worry. You'll never be examined on this type of maths. It's there for interest, really. And basically, the calculation that I'm doing is saying that if the numbers double every day, uh, I can say that's 2 to the power of 1. 2 to the power of 1 equals 2. Uh, just in a way that 2 to the power 2 equals 4, 2 to the power 1 equals 2. It's just one of those mathematical things you have to accept. 2 to the power of 1 over 2, or 2 to the power of 0 0.5, equals 1.41. So if the pandemic was doubling every two days, we just multiply the numbers by 1.41 every day, and then get the resulting number, and then multiply that by 1.41. And something that doubles every day rises incredibly fast. I found that the number uh, was about 1.25. Uh, if it doubles every three days, the number 2 to the power of 1 over 3 equals 1.259. That means it doubles every three days, and then 2 to the power of 0 0.25 doubles every four days. So once you've got about seven days of data, you can do this calculation. And I remember doing this calculation with my students last year and telling them at what date in the pandemic we would hit 30,000 cases and we hit 30,000 days cases within two days of my predicted value using this very very simple calculation. Now the epidemiologists do far more complicated calculations but this is almost like a rough back of the envelope calculation to illustrate how pandemics get going. So what I'm going to remind you of is just what situation we were in pre-lockdown. So in that week 16th to the 22nd of um, March. This was uh, when some people were talking about a possible lockdown and Spain and Italy were going into lockdown. So on the 16th of March, there were just 137 uh, new cases and 22 deaths reported on that day, with a total of 1,400 cases so far. So we're dealing with small numbers. 
and only 64 deaths so far, bearing in mind that yesterday, which was the 8th of October, there were 70 odd deaths on that one day alone. But we're still dealing with, at that point, very small numbers, but small numbers that were starting to rise in an exponential, predictable way. On the 16th, pubs were still open for the rest of that week, but they're encouraged not to be open. Universities closed, so we stopped our teaching on the 16th or 17th, and effectively shut everything down and sent everybody home, everybody home. but skill, schools were still open right up until the end of that week. So that seems like quite a bold thing to do, given that there are only 137 cases on that particular day, but by that point there were a couple of weeks of strong data telling us the doubling time, and the epidemiologists knew that doubling time was under three days on the 16th of March, and that was only going to continue throughout March and into April unless something was done. On the day of lockdown, which is on the 22nd of March, that was a stay at home order, and on that day we now risen to 603 cases per day and over 5,000 cases so far, and that was entirely predictable based upon the previous week's data, and 264 deaths so far. This is the time when all the schools were closed, on the Monday the 23rd, all the non-essential businesses closed, and effectively the country completely locked down. But the question is, if we got 600 cases on that day, how many cases were there actually at lockdown when this order was announced? And the whole point of this lecture is for you to understand exactly how many cases we think there were and what the, what the state of the pandemic was. And as we will see, it was probably much more than anybody else thought. And the estimates that were made were at the time ridiculed, but now seem to be, you know, if anything, an underestimate. So we're going to try and answer this question. How many people had COVID-19 at lockdown? An official Tests really underestimate this. Um, only the serious cases that ended up in hospital were tested. And if we're looking at um, about 5,000 cases a day at the peak, this is a huge underestimate. Now we know this must be an underestimate because if we're getting 5,000 cases a day and that's resulting in 1,000 deaths per day, which is what we saw in April, well that doesn't fit with between the 10th and the 15th of August, we had 5,000 cases. And those 5,000 cases that were officially reported only resulted in a few dozen deaths in the following two weeks. So we know that these numbers here, this 5,000 um, cases per day at the peak in early, August, in early April is a massive underestimate. And we need to find out just how much of an underestimate that was. So we look at data from as many different places as possible and do some back calculations. Now this is the key graph that comes out of that first linked article that I put on my first slide, which I told you all to have a look at and read. And this is someone who's analysed the data from the events in, in Wuhan and Hubei province. And what it plots is the increase in diagnosed patients in hospital. So these are patients turning up to hospital with clinical COVID-19 disease. What you can then do is back calculate the true new cases based on how long it takes for a person to receive the infection and then present at hospital and we're dealing with about 12 days lag. Now also on this graph is the point in which cases start exploding. So here we've got uh, January 21st cases start going on. This way you can see there's an exponential increase going on here. Now you can't actually see it from the graph because of the scale. If it was a log graph, this would be a perfect straight line. But the numbers were suggesting that we've got a doubling time of two to three days. This was clearly only going to get worse. So the cases really start shooting up here. You can get a measurable doubling time on that. A couple of days later, you have lockdown. Now the effect of lockdown is that official new infections effectively peak maybe a day after that official lockdown, a couple of days after. Everyone who's got it will be locked in at home. They'll give it to their family members, but they can't give it to anybody else. So lockdown happens here. Numbers maybe creep up a smidge, a smidgen, and then 
plateau for a couple of days and then immediately start to decrease very, very rapidly. However, the hospital admissions continue to rise and it looks like lockdown is doing nothing because at lockdown, cases just rise and rise and rise for another 12, 13 days. And this is entirely predictable because the time from infection to hospitalization is anywhere from 7 to 18 days, typically around 12 days. So once lockdown happened, you had to start the timer and say, okay, in 12, 13 days, we will find out whether this has been worth it. And indeed, in 13 days, we peaked and then hospitalization cases tended to drop off. So the key point here is the newly hospitalized cases in orange are a measure of uh, newly symptomatic patients one to two weeks prior to that in blue. So you, you become symptomatic and then a week or two later you end up in hospital. Now the hospitalization cases are measuring new infections up to three weeks earlier and peak deaths will be maybe three to four weeks at re will be representing infections three to four weeks prior. So this is why when lockdown happens, deaths don't go down as quickly as the politicians would like them to go down. Okay, so this whole data was generated by taking people who turn up in hospital who are symptomatic, asking them when their symptoms started, and then adding on a few days to account for the fact that they would have picked up the infection and then symptoms would have started a few days after that. So a patient who comes into hospital on this date would be classed as a true new infection on this date. So this is why we have such a big lag between the true new infections and patients turning up in hospital. And then subsequently you could draw another set of data points beyond here of when these patients then start to die. So based on the follow-up of uh, these patients, what we now know is that in, over this period of time, this is patients entering hospital, and this is what we also think is going on at the same time. We've got a whole bunch of pre-symptomatic patients who subsequently become symptomatic, uh, who may or may not end up in hospital. But these are the only ones that the official data um, are showing. This is the number of hospital admissions uh, in Wuhan and pretty much that was the number of cases because in China they were hospitalizing even very mild cases. Anyone who was symptomatic initially was hospitalized. So um, these are patients that you know about. These are patients that at the time we didn't know about but were infected. And from this data set we're estimating that only one in 17 cases were known about. The vast majority of COVID infected patients were not known about to the authorities. And that is no different to the UK. So one of the questions we want to answer is how many people have been or currently are infected in the UK? And there are a few things that we need to know to be able to start making these calculations and then using data from China, using data from other places and try to come to a logical answer. Uh, we know that uh, how many people have been previously infected because we can do antibody tests and when you're infected with the virus you then generate antibodies to it so if you're antibody positive you've been infected and we think around 30 to 40 percent of patients in the early studies were showing detectable levels of antibodies we can look at daily infections in hospitals and testing centers what we know early on in the pandemic is that this was very heavily skewed towards very severely ill patients. If you turned up at hospital, you got a test and you were COVID positive. Whereas if you were not unwell enough to go to hospital, you didn't get a test. Now, testing is skewed towards asymptomatic patients by contact tracing and uh, other reasons. We just got a better, we've got more tests to do. Therefore, we can test a wider range of people. So we're testing many more people who don't have symptoms so we're detecting many more people who are not going to get unwell. So we can ask the question how many are currently infected by doing viral RNA detection and we look at the test for that next week and we estimate that around 78% of the time of being tested are asymptomatic uh, and a very small minority are hospitalized and that's across the whole population. Some of these asymptomatics will become symptomatic subsequently but at the time where they tested 78% are asymptomatic. 
And we get a lot of this data from the uh, what we I call the ONS survey, the Office for National Statistics COVID Surveillance Survey, which you can follow that link and look for the most recent data on there. I'll be looking at some more of that in, on a later slide. Now, the other thing that can help us predict how the pandemic is going is how many people are hospitalised and how many people have died. However, this is probably the most reliable data. It's not affected by increases and decrease in, in screening of asymptomatic people, like the current testing system is. However, um, the problem is you're looking at the infection rate three to four weeks ago. And if you let an infection run for three to four weeks, then you start seeing deaths going up and then you start to act. You've got potentially three to four weeks of rapid increase in deaths that you can't do anything about because those infections have already occurred. And this was a major problem with lockdown on the 22nd, 23rd of March. Um, some of the most reliable estimates suggest that the majority of people who died may well have been infected prior to lockdown, which seems a really quite stark statistic to think about. But when we look back at those graphs, you'll see that that is indeed the case. And this shows how much more deadly an infection of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is, compared to influenza across many, many different years. So this is seasonal influenza in America. Lots of years of data. And what you can see is the infection fatality ratio um, of the 80-year-olds gives you a number. That's a percent of people who would die from catching uh, influenza. You know, about one in less than, uh, certainly less than uh, one in a, th sorry, certainly more than one in a thousand, maybe one in 500-ish. What you can see is if this person, if these people catch SARS, COV-2, they are 13 times more likely to die from this than they are if they're going to catch a regular seasonal influenza. And what you can see from this data was in the over 70s, and in fact from this compared to this is only comparing to influenza. You can see that in the 60s, 70s and 80s, this disease is 13 to 14 times more deadly if you catch it than influenza. And then you find that the younger people, there is a zero uh, increase. Basically, if a young person under 25 catches um, this particular infection, their chances of death are A, very small, and B, no different to if they caught regular influenza. Whereas when you get to someone of my age, we're starting to get to the age where um, this disease, uh, COVID-19, is substantially more deadly than influenza and that gap widens with increasing age. So you hear some people saying it's just like regular flu. It's not regular flu for most people. It might be for you, um, in terms of the chances of dying from it, but for everybody else, it is not regular flu.